Have you ever met anyone that could play a piece of music by ear? Do you ever wish that you could do that? That you could just sit down and only using your ears be able to figure out and play any song, either the melody or the chord progression or all the parts of the song? Well, if that's the case, you are in luck. That's what we're going to be talking about today. Hi, I'm Josh Ring, and I am here to help you create better music, believe in yourself, and share your gifts with others. And today, yes, we are going to be talking about what's called relative pitch. Uh, and if you haven't seen, Adam Neely has a great video called Why You Don't Want Perfect Pitch. And in this video, he talks a lot about this idea of relative pitch, which is where you can identify notes based on their relationship to other notes which is a really useful skill for musicians to develop and which is how we can do so many things, it seems, by magic, by ear, right? How do we learn relative pitch? How do we train ourselves to hear the relationships between notes so that we can use this skill? It's a skill that you can develop. So then the question is, what, what system should we use? And so today we're gonna walk through some various systems that we can use, and we're gonna talk about the pros and cons of each of them. So for example, just singing on a neutral syllable, singing with solfege, or singing by interval, or scale degrees. And the reason we sing so much is that it helps us reinforce what we hear in our inner ear, what we hear in our mind, right? So singing allows us to physically feel the relative distance between notes, which just helps tremendously when we're learning relative pitch like this. Yes, there is a lot of singing involved, but I'll tell you right from the get-go, I am not a singer. I am a, a pianist and an organist and a guitarist primarily. Uh, I, I am not a singer, but I, I use my voice to help train my ear so that when I sit down at the piano or something, I can play just about anything by ear, right? And so the good news is that you don't have to be a singer either, right? Don't worry about being perfect. Don't worry about you having to be able to do everything right away. Some of us are still better at reading music than doing things by ear. And so often we just give up and go straight back to just reading music because that's what we can do. So please don't give up. Don't worry about being able to do everything by ear right away. This takes time. Just take it little chunks at a time. You will get there. It really is worth the effort. Before we dive in with the various systems we're gonna be talking about, I have a free gift for you. This is my music theory survival guide. Just go to joshring.com slash free. It has my favorite system we're gonna be talking about in here and has a whole lot of other great things so that you can improve your ability as a musician. So let's dive in. First, we're gonna be talking about the neutral syllables. So singing on like a la or a da such as this. So let's start with the pros. The great thing is that you can start right away. You don't have to think about like, what scale degree necessarily is this? What syllable or number should I use with this? You can just start. And the best place to start is just pitch matching. So working on your intonation, being able to match the pitch where it should be which is incredibly helpful. Uh, another helpful thing to do while you're doing this is to imagine you're playing an instrument. So if you're playing your guitar, imagine you're playing your guitar or your saxophone or your piano, whatever it is, pretend you're playing that instrument while you're thinking through what are the notes supposed to be. And as you're doing this, then when you sit down with your instrument, you can think about what, what note should sound before you play it, right? And the other good thing about this is that there's nothing holding you back, right? When you step away from maybe using numbers or solfege or something, sometimes it gets a little garbled of like, what, what is the actual note if you're not actually using the system? With this system, you're just instantly being able to do it, right? No matter if you're singing on text or something different later. So some cons is this system doesn't take you very far. Some might not even consider it much of a system at all, to be honest, right? It's almost like throwing darts and hoping something will, will stick, right? So in this melody, it's a very stepwise melody with a few rather large leaps. But at the end here, we have this A flat in the one measure that turns into A natural by the end of the measure. So then how do we handle something like that? Da, 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 da. So by itself, it's almost more matching pitch than actual training. You have to work really hard, uh, but it is possible, I think. Uh, so to be truly effective, it still requires an understanding of scale degrees, intervals, and or some type of pitch relationships, which bring us to the next system, which is memorizing intervals. So here, going back to that amazing grace example, you can see I have some intervals here in different colors, right? So I, I've... Uh, we might use specific songs to memorize the sound 
of specific intervals. And then I would recall those. What does a major third sound like? What does a major second sound like, etc. So some pros, this goes hand in hand with a neutral syllable. You don't have to again think about like a specific number or a syllable that you might have to with solfege with this system of memorizing intervals. It's great for chromatic music. So where you're jumping around a lot, even within your melody for some disjunct melodies, we might call it, right? If you're jumping around a lot, this is great. Even in atonal music where there's not much of a, a pitch center or maybe it's constantly shifting. Maybe there's a giant modulation section. So this is great for this where you're not relying on like one home note. You're kind of shifting the tonality around. Some cons with this is that to me it takes a really long time to memorize the sound of all your specific intervals and you have to constantly think about is this a major third, a minor third, those kinds of things as you're working through. And the big thing is out of context sometimes these intervals sound different. Right, so look back at here our amazing grace example. We have this perfect fourth at the beginning, this C to the F, the scale degree five to one, and that's a very stable perfect fourth because we're landing on the home note, that five to one. It's a very, very different perfect fourth at the end here from that G to the C, right? The, the G to the C, the scale degree two to the five, very, very different perfect fourth, right? It's not as stable when we land on that as compared to our C to the F. But even worse yet is when we take the perfect fourth from like the F to the B flat, the scale degree one to the four. I couldn't stay here on the four like I could when I went to the five to the one. Right, so as we can see, not all perfect fourths are created equal. Not every interval is the same. It just depends on context, which creates problems when you memorize using a song, right? That song, that interval that you're using might be different in a different song because it's using different scale degrees. This brings us to then singing just letter names. So for example here, just actually singing the, the names of the notes give you something to think about. Really this is just great, absolutely great for reinforcing note reading, especially if you're gonna work with different clefs. So I do this often when I'm working with less familiar clefs like alto and tenor, I want to be focusing on, on more what are the exact notes I'm singing, right? So I'll do this. Here's that amazing grace in say alto clef here. I might not even be as com comfortable with it. So if I sang the notes, I would reinforce what the actual notes were. If you ignore accidentals, this can be a really helpful system for atonal or even chromatic music, right? So as you're moving around, sometimes uh, the accidentals can be ignored, right? And you're just singing A, B, even though it might be A flat, B flat. And this is very similar to fixed do, which we'll talk about later. So some cons, the letters change when the keys change. So look at this, we have F major for our first example of Amazing Grace. But when I go to G major, suddenly everything changes, even though it's still the same melody. And then also problems do arise in chromatic music. It's not a great system sometimes when we have that A flat, for example, going to the A natural. How do we handle that? Are we gonna suddenly say like A flat and then A natural? Like that's a, that's a lot to, to spit out over one chord in notes worth. A flat, F, G, A natural, B flat. So the accidentals, dealing with accidentals in chromatic music can be a challenge at best, or at worst, we're just plain ignoring them, which doesn't entirely help us when we're dealing with very chromatic music or modulations or things like that. Which brings us to the then number system. So with this system, we're gonna sing scale degrees. So here I have like C major going through, I'm memorizing what is each scale degree in C major. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. When I go to a, say, G major, now G is one, and I go through and I still have those same scale degrees because I've changed which one is the home note, the tonic note, right? So here in my Amazing Grace, I could sing it in numbers and scale degrees. Five, one, three, one, three, two, one, six, five. The great thing about this is that you're able to start relatively quickly. You do have to be really conscious of which note is home, and you might have to work a little bit of knowing which one is like four or five, right? But if you start with stepwise melodies, you can gradually increase your comfort as you get to larger leaps. Uh, the other thing is you don't need like a specific syllable. You're dealing with numbers. We all know how to count from one to seven, and then it starts back over at one. Uh, the other good thing is that the numbers stay the same even when the key changes. So here we have that F major, Amazing Grace, and when we put it in G major, it's still the same numbers. I could even sing any other key, and it doesn't matter. It's still the same numbers, it's still the same scale degrees. And with that, it goes along with, it helps you reinforce those tendency tones. So like seven wants to go to one, right? That leading tone we call it, wants to go back to tonic. And sometimes the four likes to go to three, those scale degrees, four wants to go down to three. Those kinds of things, being able to hear that and recognizing that. 
Some cons is that you, again, quickly run into problems with chromatic pitches or even minor. What are you gonna do when you have like a flat three all of a sudden? You know, how are we gonna handle that? A flat to A natural. Are we gonna ignore accidentals altogether? We're gonna say like four on beat one and then like a sharp four on beat four because it's being raised up out of the key signature. Like that's, again, a lot to spit out in just a quarter note's worth. Four, two, three, sharp four, five. So it's almost better just to use it with only major keys, right? It gets tricky when you have your flat three, your flat six that you might have in minor. When chromatic music, it gets pretty tricky, but with major music, it, it is quite quite good and very helpful. And again, it does get tricky in modulations because your home note is shifting, right? It's still possible. You just have to reimagine which note is home and when it's the new home, but it's still possible. This then leads us to what is personally my favorite system, which is solfege, right? And we're actually gonna be talking about what's called movable do, meaning that whenever we change key, do also moves with us. So here we have those numbers, but I also have the uh, now solfege syllables that go along with it, which sounds like this. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. So when I have my amazing grace example, I can sing it on those solfege syllables. So, do, mi, do, mi, re, do, la, so. Let's start with some of the pros of this before we get to some cons, because some of you are probably thinking about there's quite a few cons with this, uh, of having to memorize weird syllables with each of these. So the pro is to me, this is the most comprehensive system, right? It's the complete tool that we can work with all sorts of tonal music. We can include major, we can have minor, even it works really well with modes and chromatic music because we have syllables that we could use with all sorts of things such as this. Here we have each syllable is that note raised or lowered. So the ascending scale would sound like this, which would be the black and then that kind of that orange is my raised notes. Do, di, re, ri, mi, fa, fi, so, si, la, li, ti, do. And then the descending would sound like this, which is now the, the black, all the black, and then those blue notes would be my descending. Do, ti, te, la, le, so, se, fa, mi, me, re, ra, do. Another great thing is that the exact key, or even clef, doesn't matter, right? So going back to that, we had that F major, change it to G major, still the same syllables. Or here, if I change it, from that G major to this A major and alto clef all of a sudden, you can see the, the lines and spaces, the notes are on the same lines and spaces. And so therefore the syllables will remain the same, even though I'm not as comfortable knowing which what the note is, right? Knowing it's E to A to then a C sharp to A kind of thing. But if I recognize, okay, that's where Do is, I can work from there. And it's very helpful to hear what the music will sound like. Another pro is that it, this system really does become second nature if you become fluent with it, right? It does take a little bit of time, and I'll get to that in a moment, but once you're fluent, it's second nature and it becomes really easy. And to me, this is the best solution for chromatic music, right? When you have a lot of accidentals, you have that system for each accidental note. So some cons that some of you might be throwing out already is that it does probably take the longest to learn, right? And to me, if you're if you're only gonna half-heartedly approach this, it's almost a waste of time more than anything, right? So if you're gonna do this, really commit from the beginning, which I think it's absolutely worth the time you put in. My ear has increased so quickly once I committed to saying I'm gonna use Solfege fully. Uh, it's, in that sense, it's almost like a, a foreign language. Right, it, you have these syllables you have to memorize with each scale degree. But once you're fully fluent again, you just you can just spout it out, and it's second nature to you. Another con is that modulations can be a bit tricky. Right, uh, it's kind of how we had with scale degrees and singing on numbers. When you have modulations with solfege, you have to reinvent which note is the new home, and that can be a little tricky. But once you think through it, it's really not so bad. There are ways around it. With those chromatic notes, now I have a full, complete system for that problem we had with the A flats to A natural. We have, we are not just ignoring it, we're, we're completely addressing it now, finally. Mi, fa, so, la, so, fa, re, mi, fi, so. To recap, we've been talking about movable dough. So that means whatever key signature it, we are in, that tonic note, that home note is always going to be do. So if we're in C major, C is do, but when we modulate to say G major, 
Now G is going to be Do, and we're going to keep moving the solfege over so that all the other notes align. And when we get to fixed Do, like I mentioned earlier, it's still the same when we're in the key of C, but when we go to like G major here, you can see G is now starting on Sol, because C is always Do, and G is always Sol. So actually fixed Do solfege is very similar to singing just the note letter names, where the note is always called by the same name, right? The same solfege syllable. And there are actually some countries that use fixed do as their letter names, complete with their chromatic inflections. Uh, and there are some advantages to this, right? So first is that the syllables don't have to change necessarily based on what note you're singing, right? So the note is always the same syllable. The downside is that when you change key, the syllables will change. It's not like how, how we have for Amazing Grace. It's no longer so do. Uh, now it'll depend what key we're in, what the new syllables are going to be. The other thing is that when you ignore the chromatic inflections, sometimes you just sing this straight note. It's some type of G, doesn't matter if it's G sharp, G flat, or G natural, right? Where it's always soul, right? And so with that, it can be helpful with atonal music to kind of help you if like it's, it's around this area right, as you're working and you can get more comfortable when you're singing these highly chromatic or, or atonal passages. So then the question is when we get to minor, what do we do? And it, since I personally love Movable though, that's what we're going to continue talking about with our minor. So one option is having what's called a law based minor, such as this, where law is now home. And so that's again, relative major and minor. So C major being relative to A minor, relative because they have the same key signatures. So the same key signature kind of be like the same DNA, right? So the C major and A minor have the same DNA there. And so we have these chromatic inflections for Fi now and C as being raised up. La, ti, do, re, mi, fa, si, la. Um, so the opposite then is the do based minor, meaning that do is still home. And now we have new syllables, the lowered me, le, and te as the lowered third, sixth, and seventh, respectively. Do, re, me, fa, so, le, ti, do. Let's look at what a la based minor would look like. La, do, re, mi, fa, mi, re, ti, so, la, ti, do, la, la, si, la, ti, si, mi. So some pros of this law based system. It's easier to jump into, admittedly, right? You're still kind of using that same la, ti, do. It's just now la is home. Uh, it really reinforces what are your relative major and minor keys, which, which can be helpful. And it's also very helpful when it modulates between a major and minor, relative major and minor. And the pitch relations do say the same, like la to do is still the same relationship. It's still that kind of minor third, right? But the difference is now instead of uh, it being six to one as la to do in major, it's now one to flat three in minor for scale degrees. So some, some disadvantages to the system is that your f the function of each syllable has now changed, which is a huge thing, right? We've been working really, really hard to keep Do as home, and sometimes we work really hard to keep like Sol as a, another stable place that's farther away from Do. And now suddenly all of that has changed. Now it's La is home and Mi is your new fifth, which can be really complicated, right? Changing from Do and Sol being your tonic and dominant, now La and Mi are tonic and dominant, which confuses us a little bit as in we're, when we're thinking in terms of function of the notes. Now you have to learn C all of a sudden, the C as an SI being the leading tone wanting to go to La, which is again, your new home. And to me, this isn't what real music functions like, right? We have a lot of like modal music, we have blues, right? Chromatic. So those kinds of things don't work super well with this system because Maybe Do is home and then La is, is home. It's kind of switching a whole lot of things just to make your modal interchange work. And now if you arpeggiate chords, which I like to do with like the Do, Mi, So kind of thing for arpeggiating your one chord, now your syllables would be La, Do, Mi for your one chord, which again complicates things. We've been changing up which one's home. Again, my favorite system, right? Using Do based minor, right? We're just memorizing Me, Le, and Te. So here's what that would sound like. Do me fa so le so fa re te do re me do do ti do re ti sol. And the beautiful thing is we know really well which note is home because it's do. We know which note is tonic uh, then. And we also then know which note is dominant, sol, right? So we can recognize when we have uh, that arpeggiation of the five chord at the end, that sol ti re and re ti sol at the end. 
So some pros, it reinforces the doe soul relationship as tonic and dominant, right? We've been working really well to get those stuck in your ear. And those functions stay the same. T is still the same leading tone wanting to go back home to do. It works really well with parallel minors. So parallel would be like C major to C minor. That works really well, which is really helpful for blues notes. It's really helpful for modal interchange when you're dealing, dealing with modes and various chromatic notes. And as you learn the do bass minor, it's also a really great system for learning the descending chromatic scale, right? You have then your me, le, and te as descending notes. You only have two more. You have the ra as your flat two, and you have your uh, se for your flat five. And then you, you have all the notes that you need for your descending chromatic scale if you use your do based minor. And then the other great thing, if you again are arpeggiating your harmonies, most of those notes are going to stay the same. Every now and then you're going to change a me to a me for your flat three and maybe your la to your lay for your flat six. So your do, mi, sol that you've been arpeggiating working with for your one chord now is just do, me, sol, right? So just changing things just ever so slightly. So some cons, yes, it does require learning some new syllables for your flat three, flat six, and flat seven. But I think that's a small price to pay in order to keep do as home. One final caveat for all of these systems, please, 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 whatever you do, do not write in your music. If you're uh, trying to maybe work with a sight reading book or you're trying to learn these systems of scale degrees and solfege, writing in numbers or letters, don't write that in your music. Then you're just, you're just reading the numbers or the letters that you've written down, right? You want to work diligently to reinforce these notes in your ear, in your mind, so that you know what the solfege syllable or the interval or the scale degree, whatever it is that's in your mind, not just reading it on a page. Yes, I recognize it does take longer that way to, to fully internalize it. If you don't do it that way, you're just reading the, what you write on the page. And you wanna make sure you're reading those and thinking about what are the scale degrees or the solfege syllables that go along with it each time. So to wrap up, let me just ask, what system do you like best? What system have you used? What systems maybe have you had success with? Please let me know in the comments below. I'm really interested to hear from you. What, what do you use? What have you had success with? So again, we have the just singing on a neutral syllable like la or da, working with intervals. So thinking about what is the exact interval from one note to the next at all times, singing just letter names, singing in numbers, and then we again had solfege. And at solfege, we had fixed do versus movable do. We also had do based minor versus la based minor. And again, my personal favorite is the movable do with a do based minor system. Thanks again for hanging out with me. Please don't forget your free music theory survival guide. Just go to joshring.com free. So thanks guys.